Good evening, gourds and gals, and welcome to my review of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, the first film in a series about a magical orphan who has a thing for bookworms and impoverished redheads, as well as a prejudice against the disabled. The movie opens at night in a quiet neighborhood with a Magic the Gathering cosplayer turning out the lights before talking to a cat. The cat gives a little meow, and then it turns into a bespectacled little hottie named Professor McGonagall. Moments later, they are joined by a burly boy on a flying motorcycle. He's enormously tall with a bushy beard, and he's wearing the kind of coat you'd see on somebody about to perform a public flashing, or as I prefer to call them, an old school gender reveal. Also, he's brought with him a baby. He carries it over to the elders, and they walk up to the house which apparently belongs to his aunt and uncle. Instead of knocking on the door to give the infant over to the grown-ups, they leave him on the doorstep as a little surprise. I really admire UPS and their dedication to overnight delivery, as well as their consideration for their sleeping customers. That said, I don't think leaving a helpless infant outside for hours would go over well with OSHA. And just imagine being the aunt and uncle and waking up to a package that had sold itself overnight and will cost you tens of thousands of dollars over the course of the coming years. What can Brown do for you? At least they didn't send out one of those drivers who just tosses packages haphazardly. Look at this and envision that's a baby. The older man says, Good luck, Harry Potter. And a close-up reveals the child has a cut on its forehead. Or perhaps it's just the letter Z and he's being dropped off after a ZZ Top concert got a bit out of hand. In fact, given the dress and the beards of the grown-ups, I think this to be the most plausible explanation. Fast forward a decade and we see young Harry living the high life inside the equivalent of a $3,500 per month NYC apartment. He even gets an invitation to his cousin's birthday party. As they're getting ready to leave, his uncle Vernon warns him that any funny business will result in him not eating for a week, and I'm pretty sure those meals will go to Vernon and that Harry is a repeat offender. They visit the zoo and Harry talks to a snake which surprisingly understands English. This causes his excited cousin to lean on the terrarium glass and fall in as the barrier vanishes, seemingly at Harry's will and you'd be forgiven for wondering if that scar is the mark of the beast. Away from me, Satan. The little monster laughs as the snake escapes and we hear screaming in the background, so I assume it killed most of the patrons. No meals for Harry. Sometime later, he receives the mail and is surprised to see that a letter is addressed to him. Cousin Dudley snatches it away to show his parents and they are disturbed to see the word Hogwarts stamped on the back, which I'm pretty sure is some kind of cult or STD. For days on end, there are attempts to deliver Harry this letter by owls, and if you aren't an Amazon Prime member, these are the benefits you're missing out on, even if they occasionally get overzealous. Seriously, this is like a scene from The Birds if it were made by the aforementioned company and instead of attacking the populace, they were obsessively focused on customer service. And also if the director were named Alfred Hitchcock. I regret nothing. Vernon moves the family to a house on a private island and instead of saying thank you for upgrading his living situation again, all Harry can do is mope about how no one will celebrate his birthday at midnight. You aren't New Year's Eve, champ, and unlike that holiday, your balls haven't dropped. The door to the island dwelling suddenly bursts open and the giant from the beginning of the film, whose name is Hagrid, arrives to bring Harry a birthday cake as well as his invitation to Hogwarts. After lighting the fire with his umbrella as one typically does, he tells Harry that he's actually a wizard and that Hogwarts is a school that will teach him magic. Uncle Vernon protests him going to the magic camp and his Aunt Petunia admits that Harry's mom was a witch and got a similar letter when she was a kid. Also, he's told his parents were murdered after long believing they had died in a car crash. Hagrid then calls the two of them a slur for non-magic people and gives Dudley either a tail or tapeworm before asking Harry to come with him, which he does. Remember kids, you can not only trust strangers, you should leave with them when they ask because they might take you somewhere cool like a park or a dungeon. They go to a bar and Harry is surprised to learn that its patrons all know him once Hagrid speaks his name. Many even come over to shake his hand, including someone named Quirrell who looks like he probably isn't allowed within 500 yards of a school. Naturally, he's a teacher. Hagrid then escorts Harry behind the bar where he opens up the magical doorway to a place called Diagon Alley, where he'll be able to buy all of his school supplies. If you've ever been to Tennessee, it's a lot like Gatlinburg. Or if you've ever been to Orlando, it's like the wizarding world of Harry Potter. They head over to the wizard bank called Gringotts, which is run by greedy creatures with big pointy noses, and I cannot think of a single applicable joke, so you're free to make your own in the comments below, and I'm sure they'll be wholesome. Moving on. 
It turns out that not only was Harry raised in posh conditions, his parents also left him a small fortune. Being famous and magical on top of this, I think it's possible he's the most privileged human being in cinema history. For comparison's sake, all Hagrid has in the bank is a rock wrapped in a piece of paper. Say it with me, Harry. I take responsibility. For their next stop, Hagrid drops the lad off with an old man named Ollivander who lets Harry fiddle with his sticks. What? Sorry, he allows Harry to handle his wood. No, no, definitely not. <clears throat> He hands Harry various wands and waits for one to choose him. He's given all 11 inches of holly with a bit of phoenix tail, and Ollivander tells him that the bird which provided the core gave one other feather to the wand that gave Harry his scar. Wow, a famous wizard with a wand of holly wood? Much like the bankers at Gringotts, I think JK was being a bit on the nose. Then again, the person who gave Harry the scar doesn't have a nose, so it sort of evens out. Later that evening, Hagrid tells Harry about this very person named Voldemort who killed his parents and used to terrorize the magical community. Harry is famous because he survived an attempted murder and this failure apparently caused Voldemort to retire in shame. Also, he was sprayed in the face with a love spell or something and I think that's supposed to explain how he lost his nose. The following day, Harry is taken to the train station and is told to go to platform 9 and 3 quarters, which confuses the lad because he's never gone to school and doesn't understand fractions. He eventually overhears the muggle slur again and it leads him to a family of magical gingers named the Weasleys. Harry watches his peers disappear through the wall between platforms 9 and 10, proving that walls wouldn't be effective against immigrant wizards. Harry follows their lead and then gets onto the train. He's eventually joined by Ron, the youngest son of the Weasley family. A trolley comes down the aisle and Harry buys all the sweets to flex his wealth and establish his superiority over his poverty-stricken new friend. The one of the chocolate frogs escapes and commits Minecraft. Ron then tries to show Harry how to turn a rat yellow, but they are interrupted by a girl named Hermione. Ron's spell doesn't work and then Hermione sits down opposite Harry and has one of her own. Oculus Repair Room. I assume this was meant to fix Harry's eyes, but it just pulls the tape from his glasses, so better luck next time. Anyway, they arrive at Hogwarts, and after being greeted by Professor McGonagall, dressed tantalizing as always, our titular character comes face to face with Draco Malfoy, who looks like Kevin McAllister from Home Alone if you just added Grease. Draco offers to help Harry avoid the wrong sort of wizards, but Harry says he can spot redheads just fine. Speaking of sorting, it is just after this that the children are brought into the main hall to be segregated according to their character, just like Martin Luther King Jr. always dreamed. And this is done with a pointy hat, also like MLK dreamed. Kids who are brave get to be in Gryffindor, the rich and cool kids like Draco get to go with House Slytherin, Ravenclaw is for the smart little ones, though we don't see any get picked for that house, so it must have been a slow year. And Hufflepuff is for the kids that check that other box that you might see on a job application. Seriously, nobody likes a Hufflepuff for at least three books. D are you serious? After Harry gets a rather creepy look from a teacher who gives the word Slytherin a whole new meaning, he puts on the sorting hat and is told he could be one of the cool kids but decides to be a nerd and chooses Gryffindor instead so he can hang out with Ron and Hermione. Once this is over, the children are treated to a feast which appears magically in front of them and it's worth noting that if you have read the books, you learn that this food is provided by creatures called house elves who are basically happy slaves. I can actually think of another kind of happy slave who also had the word house in their title and I wonder what JK is trying to tell us here. The following day, Harry and Ron go to their first classes starting with Transfiguration. A cat is on the desk waiting for them, and suddenly I hear Van Halen's Hot for Teacher playing in my head. Wands out for McGonagall. Next on the schedule is Potions with Professor Snape, who sort of dresses like a Catholic priest if he were really depressed and wasn't very into children. During their lunch period, Harry reads the newspaper while the non-orphans receive mail from their loved ones. He notices a story that says someone tried to break into the same vault Hagrid showed Harry earlier in the movie. Back to their classes, the next lesson is held outdoors where Harry learns to fly on a broomstick, which he takes to very quickly. Hermione struggles with it, probably because she's a girl and is supposed to hold brooms in a very different way. A kid named Neville Longbottom is injured when he flies too high and falls and as the teacher takes him to the hospital wing, she tells her students they're not allowed on their brooms while she's gone or they'll be expelled. Draco picks up an object Neville dropped and taunts Harry by taking it up into the air. Harry follows after him and demands to have it back. Have it your way then. 
After Draco's delivery of the Burger King slogan, Harry races after the object and catches it rather spectacularly in front of Professor McSpicy, who then comes out to administer discipline. She comes outside and tells Harry to follow behind her. They go to Professor Quirrell's office and she asks to borrow his wood. Discipline, a view of McGonagall's backside, and she wants wood? I have never been more envious in my entire life. Harry's punishment is that he is forced to play outdoor sports for his house's Quidditch team and is the first first-year student to have to do this in a century. You'd be forgiven for thinking the school is run by a failed Austrian painter. Later that evening, Harry, Ron, and Hermione take a detour while heading back to their dormitory and end up in a room with a deformed but adorable doggo with three heads. They get away and Hermione notes that the creature was guarding a door beneath its feet. The next day, Harry goes with Oliver Wood, the Gryffindor Quidditch captain, to learn about the sport. Not knowing much about Quidditch myself, my research led me down a very dark rabbit hole of internet searches. Please steer clear of related terms such as beaters, the golden snatch, and blue quaffle. Following the lesson, a tiny teacher shows the students how to make objects float, which you'd think would come easily to Harry since he flies so well. Hermione masters the spell almost immediately, so Harry and Ron apply bro code and shun her for being a nerd. After a breathtaking shot of pumpkins rightfully hovering over all living things, Harry and Ron learn that Hermione is crying in the girls' bathroom as the rest of the school enjoys the Halloween feast, proving the power and necessity of shame. The party is soon interrupted as Professor Quirrell rushes into the Great Hall and shouts about a troll in the dungeon before fainting. Probably not appropriate for a teacher to call Hermione a troll, and more than a little creepy that he calls the girls' bathroom a dungeon, but way to one-up Harry and Ron. Everyone is told to go back to their house dorms, but the boys rush to tell Hermione about the danger. Turns out the troll is making his way into the girls' bathroom because he doesn't conform to gender norms. Hermione is confronted by the beast, which looks like Shrek if his parents were siblings. Harry gets up on the monster's shoulders, and as it swings its club at him, Ron uses the levitation spell to lift its club and drop it on its head. What a bigot! They are then discovered by the teachers who were hunting the beast, and Harry notices a cut on Professor Snape's leg, which makes him think something fishy is going on. Hermione loses five points for House Gryffindor for using the restroom, while Harry and Ron gain five each for disobeying the orders of the headmaster. The next day, Harry prepares for his first Quidditch match, and after noticing Snape is limping, he voices his suspicions that the professor let the troll in as a diversion to retrieve whatever the three-headed dog is guarding, which he believes is whatever Hagrid had in his Gringotts vault. Then Harry receives a package which turns out to be a high-end broomstick from Professor McGonagall, which makes sense because he left the girls' bathroom pretty dirty the night before, and that was after the troll incident. Cut over to the Quidditch pitch, where Harry joins his teammates for their first match against Slytherin. As Ryan Reynolds once said, it's time to put balls in holes. Harry's broom gets bored watching the match and starts to buck him off. Hermione spots Snape muttering under his breath and figures he's calling Harry the N-word and sets his clothes on fire. The broom suddenly starts to work right again, and he then puts the little gold ball in his mouth, and Gryffindor wins the match. What a strange game. Afterwards, Potter and company voice their concerns about Snape's racism to Hagrid, and he attempts to quell their fears while accidentally confirming that the three-headed dog is guarding something and that the business of the object in question is between Professor Dumbledore and Nicholas Flamel. The children wonder over who the latter person is, which is a good indication that this story is set in a pre-internet year, as one quick Google search would have shown them that he was a Frenchman who died in the early 15th century. They enter the Christmas season, and Harry and Ron spend it at school because their families don't love them. On Christmas morning, Harry receives a sweater from Ron's mother and an invisibility cloak so nobody has to see him in it. He hides under the cloak and goes to the library to find information on Nicholas Flamel. Worst Christmas ever. He comes across Professor Snape and Quirrell in the darkness, and Snape accosts his colleague for cultural appropriation. Harry gets away and ends up in a room in front of a mirror which shows him standing with his dead parents. Very morbid. Astonished, he brings Ron to the room later on and his friend sees himself in it being very popular and accomplished. Harry is confused because he apparently thought this mirror was specifically designed to show people his parents. What a narcissistic little wanker. He visits the mirror again a different night and Dumbledore comes in and watches him for a bit before telling him that the mirror is designed to show the looker the thing they desire most. I suppose now I'm glad this takes place in a time before the internet because nowadays that mirror would basically just be P-Hub on demand. 
If I were in front of the mirror of Erised, I'd see all of you liking this video and subscribing to my channel right now, and I'd be enjoying a martini with your mom. Sometime after the holidays, the boys are back in the library where Hermione joins them with a book describing Nicholas Flamel as a rock enthusiast. This is not a rock, this is a mineral for a tenth time. And the maker of the famed Sorcerer's Stone, which makes you live forever, just like the Keto Diet or Keith Richards' Medicinal Regimen. They also figure this to be the item guarded by the three-headed dog. They go to Hagrid's later that night to tell him that they know about the stone, but he's distracted by an egg he's cooking in a pot. You know how mother hens give warmth to their eggs by sitting on them? Well, it turns out that if you apply more heat, you'll not only hatch them faster, but they'll come out fully grown but without any feathers. Don't take my word for it, trust the science. Hagrid spots Draco Malfoy outside the window, who then takes off and informs Professor McGonagall about their party. She comes out wearing a saucy nightgown and all of the children are given detention, including Malfoy, proving to Harry that she can catch a snitch without even using a broom. <coughs> Unlike most schools who make their students sit quietly and maybe copy lines, the Hogwarts method of detention turns out to be going outside at night with Hagrid, which is weird because that's what all of them were punished for in the first place. Also, they must venture into the Forbidden Forest with him to track down an injured unicorn. Punishing rule breakers with actions that would otherwise break the rules? What a strange system, but one I'd be willing to try. They split into two teams with Hermione and Ron going with Hagrid, while Harry and Draco get to take Hagrid's dog Fang. The latter duo eventually finds the unicorn, which is lying dead while a hooded figure drinks its blood. Malfoy runs and the figure moves towards Harry looking like a shadow of Yarnum. Fortunately, he is rescued by Phoebe Waller-Bridge's cousin. The horseman tells Harry that unicorn blood has the ability to keep the drinker alive, but curse the person who ingests it. He asks if Harry knows anyone who would be willing to do this, and because he cannot remember the names of any drag queens, Harry names Voldemort and realizes he must be after the Sorcerer's Stone, which has similar effects. He tells this to Ron and Hermione later that night, but Hermione reassures him that Dumbledore will keep him safe. Harry, however, realizes later on that whoever sold Hagrid the dragon egg must have tricked him and this is confirmed when Hagrid says the seller was interested in the three-headed dog, and he revealed that playing it music would put it to sleep. I would trust Hagrid with my life. I say that's ill-advised. The kids rush to see Professor McGonagall, just like I would, saying they need to see Professor Dumbledore, but she informs them that he is away on urgent business. They try to warn her that someone is going to try to steal the stone, but she assures them that it's safe and they are dismissed. They run into Professor Snape, and Harry is convinced he means to take the stone for Voldemort because he has a big nose and dresses like an emo. They decide to go down the trap door that night, though they don't say what they plan to do or how they'll do it. Or even how often, since one might think that if they're successful, the thief might just try again later. Neville Longbottom is waiting for them and says he plans to stop them so they won't get Gryffindor into any trouble again. How many nights in a row has he waited like this since they received attention? Hermione makes Neville hard and they leave him lying there like a corpse. When they get to the trap door, the dog is already asleep because of an enchanted harp. They move the creature's paw and just as they're about to go through the door, something white and gooey drips on Ron's shoulder. Must have been a really good song. The dog wakes up and attempts to attack the children, but they get through the door and fall onto a bed of vines. They begin being wrapped up by the plant, and Hermione tells them to just relax and let it happen, and oh wow, this is a really bad lesson. Harry listens, and the two of them end up safe on the other side, but Ron continues to struggle to maintain his dignity. Hermione fires sunlight at the plant, and rather than being strengthened by photosynthesis, it goes limp and Ron is saved. Next, they enter a room filled with flying creatures and a broom floating close to the ground. Clearly, the task here is for Hermione to sweep up the droppings like a good lady, but instead, Harry flies up and catches the one with the broken wing. Turns out, it's a flying key. They unlock the door, and it takes them to a space where they are blocked from crossing the room by large chess pieces that resemble something out of Dark Souls. Praise the sun, it's time for a montage. Ron sacrifices himself, and Harry proceeds down a stairway to the final stage. There he is met by Professor Quirrell, who stands before the Mirror of Erised from earlier, and apparently his greatest desire was to speak clearly, and his wish was granted. 
Harry is stunned to see that it isn't Professor Snape and learns that his teacher was trying to protect him all along. Quirrell reveals that he tried to curse Harry's broomstick, let the troll into the girl's bathroom, and that he's thirsty for more unicorn. Personally, I think Harry should have stood in front of a normal mirror to reflect on his prejudices, but instead, Quirrell makes him stand before the magical one and he sees himself holding the stone, which somehow transports it into his pocket. Does this mean his parents were in his pocket earlier in the movie? Kind of sus. Harry lies to Quirrell about what he sees in the mirror, and a voice says to let him speak to the boy. Quirrell removes his turban, and it turns out that he has a tumor which is possessed by the spirit of Voldemort. He has a nose in this form, so at least it's sort of an upgrade. Voldemort discerns that the stone must be in Harry's pocket and orders his minion to get the rock, but instead, he gets these hands. Turns out Harry is a carrier of some kind of Delta variant monkeypox, and it causes Quirrell to dissolve into a pile of ash. Voldemort gets away and leaves Harry on the ground with what's left of the disabled person he just killed with disease. He wakes up in the infirmary some time later and finds gifts and fan mail from fellow students, and receives a visit from the headmaster. He's informed that his friends are okay, but that the Sorcerer's Stone has been destroyed and that Nicholas Flamel will die. Dumbledore then says that Quirrell couldn't stand to touch Harry because of his mother's love for him. So if you ever find yourself being touched by someone and they don't dissolve into ash, your parents don't love you. The last day of school arrives and Dumbledore announces that it is time to award the House Cup. Gryffindor comes in last place with Slytherin winning, but then Dumbledore counts some last minute 2am votes, I mean awards our characters 170 points, and Gryffindor ekes out a victory and claims the prize. Worth noting that Albus Dumbledore was in Gryffindor as a student, so I think there's enough reason to be suspicious of foul play. And I think we should peacefully enter his office in protest, I mean send a strongly worded letter. The kids get on the train and Harry waves goodbye to Hagrid, but before he leaves, his large friends suggest using threats of magical violence against his cousin. And on that ominous note, the movie ends. Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone was the biggest box office film of 2001, and it's kind of crazy to me that over two decades have passed since its release, and that it came out around the same time as the first Lord of the Rings film. What an incredible time for fantasy cinema. While I do not hold this movie in nearly as high regard as any of Peter Jackson's adaptations of Tolkien, I still think the first Harry Potter film is a pretty solid adaptation and a fun movie overall. It certainly has a good number of writing flaws, much like its source material or the 19th Amendment, and some of the special effects have aged about as well as Madonna's plastic surgery, or the 19th Amendment. All the same, it mostly stands the test of time, and I'd give it a 6.5 out of 10. Thanks for watching, gourds and gals. If there is a movie you'd like to see get this treatment, you can let me know in the comments below. I hope you had yourself some fun, and I'll see you again soon, but until then, God bless, and gourd speed.